Good morning and welcome to the Post Monetary Policy Committee press conference. The Monetary Policy Committee held its meeting yesterday, Monday, the 26th of June. And as is customary, uh, today we'll listen to the Governor of the Central Bank going through the rationale behind that decision. We'll also, uh, within this press conference, be able to take your questions on that decision um, and uh, the rationale behind it. Now, for today, there are slightly different rules, uh, and I think I've briefed uh, quite a number of uh, the members of the media. We shall be taking questions uh, strictly around the MPC and its decision and anything adjacent to that, meaning uh, issues of the economy and the rest, because we will have a more generalized press conference within the next couple of weeks at which we will make it a lot more general for those kind of questions. So for today, if you're able to uh, keep your questions to issues of the MPC decision and the economy, uh, we'll be glad to do so. As usual, the hashtag is hashtag MPC0623. That is on Slido, www.slido.com. Put your questions there. Please make sure you introduce yourself by your name and your institution so we can take those questions in the context in which they are put. But for now, we want to welcome and introduce the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Kamau Thuge. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Wallace. Uh, as uh, most of you know, the Monetary Policy Committee um, did meet on May 29th. Uh, there have been uh, uh, some questions uh, uh, have been raised as to why we are again meeting uh, on uh, why we met on June the 26th. When the Monetary Policy Committee met on May 29th, um, they had uh, the, inf the information that they had uh, before they made the decision to uh, maintain the CBR uh, unchanged at 9.5 was a situation where the inflation uh, rate seems to be improving and the prospects for lower inflation uh, was, uh, looked quite imminent. Uh, the inflation rate, uh, when they met, had actually declined uh, from 9.2% uh, in March to about 7.9%. Uh, and that reduction uh, actually in uh, most of the items in the, in the CPI did actually uh, decline. For example, fuel prices had declined uh, from roughly 13.4% to 13.2%. Uh, food prices had also declined quite significantly from 13.4 to roughly 10.1. And uh, equally important was the non-food, uh, non-fuel price that had uh, uh, reduced from 4.4% to 4.1. So from that perspective, the, um, the Monetary Policy Committee then was of the view that inflationary pressures had decreased and the prospects going forward were quite uh, positive. In fact, at that point, uh, the CBK had uh, anticipated that inflation for May may even be within uh, below the upper range of, uh, of the C, uh, CBK target of 7.5 and had anticipated that it would actually go to 7.1. So on the basis of that, uh, the, the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, therefore decided to leave the rate um, unchanged at 9.5. So I think that was the right decision at that point, given the information that was available then. Since that time, uh, we then received information uh, on inflation for uh, May. And that information indeed indicated that uh, inflation had accelerated and instead of it going to 7.1, it had actually going to, uh, to uh, 8%. And uh, again, most of the items went up, food prices went up, fuel prices also went up, and core, and, and core inflation uh, as non-food and, uh, and, and non-fuel also went up. So at the time we met, uh, it, we, we felt then uh, with these uh, uh, upward pressure on prices and, uh, and also prospective uh, uh, increase in inflation, that it was necessary that the Monetary Policy Committee meet again uh, on June uh, 26 to uh, have another look at uh, the prospects for inflation uh, going forward. And it's, so it's on that basis that we have called, we call this meeting on uh, June the 26th to review uh, the inflationary situation uh, given the new numbers. 
So that was just to give you a background as to why we had uh, a, a meeting of the MPC, basically uh, not uh, that was uh, called before the next cycle of meetings, which is expected to be uh, in July. So with that, uh, let me now try and, and uh, give you a presentation on the factors and the reasons that went into why we, um, we had to uh, raise the CBR rate from 9.5% uh, to 10.5%. Uh, the MPC noted uh, sustained inflationary pressures and increased risks to the inflation outlook, elevated global risks, and their potential impact on the domestic economy. The MPC thus concluded that there was scope for a further tightening of monetary policy to anchor inflationary expectations. Uh, and let me just add here that um, obviously the mandate of the central bank is to implement monetary policy with a view to containing uh, or uh, stabilizing uh, prices. And in my view, in my view, um, inflation is almost like uh, a tax because it reduces everybody's real incomes. And so it's, it's very important that we address the inflationary pressures with the idea of actually reducing the cost of, uh, the cost of living. And as you know, uh, the cost of living is one of the issues that has, been, uh, that has uh, concerned um, uh, the country. And therefore, it is critically important that we address inflation because everybody is affected by inflation. And everybody, even those who don't have incomes, are affected by inflation. And therefore, we must address inflation and address and anchor inflationary expectations. So the Monetary Policy Committee will closely monitor the, uh, the impact of the policy measures as well as developments in the global and domestic economy and stands ready to take further action as necessary. So the committee will meet again uh, uh, next month, uh, July 2023. So uh, let me go to the, um, the global look at the global environment and start with the inflation. Inflation in advanced economies has been easing, but has remained above respective targets with uh, persistent core inflationary pressures. The headline inflation has been declining uh, with monetary policy tightening and uh, lower commodity uh, prices. Core inflation has remained elevated due to the strong service uh, service price increases and cost pressures from uh, tight labor markets. Let's go to the next. So um, with regard to commodity prices, um, you can see that uh, oil and food uh, have continued to ease, mainly due to improved supply and uh, weaker demand. The price of oil has declined with a weaker demand, but remains volatile due to increased uncertainties to global uh, growth. And you can see there, Melbourne oil prices uh, as of June, June 1st, was at uh, US dollar 74.7. Uh, on food prices, uh, these have also declined with a rebound in global supplies and the extension of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. However, uh, sugar prices have been uh, rising sharply due to the reduced uh, supply. And this uh, chart that just uh, indicates that the global freight transportation costs have been uh, declining, and this is the, um, the index uh, for a 40 foot. Uh, container. Um, so there's been a persistence since about uh, September of 2021. There's been a, a consistent decline in uh, in those um, costs. So looking to the global economic outlook, we see that uh, in terms of the world growth uh, for 2021, uh, the global economy grew by 6.3 percent. 
And since that time, uh, of course, this was a recovery from 2020 when uh, globally we were all affected by the COVID-19. So uh, last year it grew by 3.4%. And uh, the, uh, it's expected to slow down to 2.8%. This is, uh, these are estimates from the IMF uh, World Economic Outlook that came out in, I believe it was in uh, April. But you can also see that uh, the prospects for the United States uh, growth was 59 in 2021. Uh, decelerated to 2.1 and we expect a further deceleration to 1.6. And um, it's good you, you note this uh, as we later on look at the balance of payments and look at uh, the prospects for remittances from the United States. At the bottom uh, of that table is um, the Kenyan story. And you can see in 2021, uh, the growth was uh, 7.5. I think that has since been revised to 7.6. And then for 2022, the growth, I believe, was 4.8. But essentially, you can see that uh, even with a slowdown in, in Kenya's growth, it is higher than the sub-Saharan average. It is higher than, uh, and, the, and of course, it's higher than the global average. For 2023, uh, we will come uh, later to the estimates um, for Kenya's growth. Uh, based not on the WIO, but based on what uh, the central bank has been doing. Uh, regarding domestic inflation, uh, we can see that, um, and as I noted a bit earlier, there was an increase in overall inflation in May of 2023, driven by higher fuel, food, and non-food, and non-fuel prices. And if you just focus on the last two, uh, April 23 to May 23, you can see that uh, the, the blue uh, column, which is food, uh, increases from 10.1 to 10.2. And we'll have, we'll have a look at another chart that explains exactly which food items were driving uh, the inflation uh, somewhat higher. You can see fuel increases from 13.2 to 13.6. And uh, importantly, uh, we see that the non-food, uh, non-fuel, has increased from 4.1 to 4.3. And the, that 4.3 is almost at the peak uh, uh, if you compare it to February uh, 2023 when it reached a peak of 4.4. The next chart just uh, looks at the contribution uh, to overall inflation of food, fuel, and uh, non-food, non-fuel. And just looking at the, uh, the, the last three columns, actually, you can see that um, uh, just focusing on NF, NF, the non-food, non-fuel, uh, that the contribution in March was actually 1%. The contribution uh, from fuel was 3.2%. And the contribution from food was 5%. The reason I point that out is to see that in the next two months that the contribution to inflation from non-food and non-fuel has actually increased from one, one percentage point to 1.3 percentage points, whereas uh, for fuel it has declined and so has the, the food, uh, food prices. I distinguish uh, between non-food and uh, non-fuel from fuel and food because to a certain extent the monetary policy, the central bank's uh, monetary policy, has a uh, more direct impact on non-food and, uh, and non-fuel. Uh, and so um, uh, we'll see whether there's another chart that shows actually the development of non-food, non-fuel over the years. In fact, this is, um, this is it. You can see that um, the non-food, non-fuel uh, inflation has increased indicating persistent underlying inflationary pressures in the economy. And you can see for quite some time, from uh, actually from August 2019 to only recently, uh, perhaps even June 2022, that non-food, non-fuel uh, inflation was actually below uh, 3%. And uh, below 3% is what we believe is consistent with an overall inflation of 
5%. Uh, so the fact that we are now uh, above uh, 4% is very high and shows persistent uh, inflation. And, uh, and that's why um, it explains part of the reason why we had to take very strong uh, measures in order to contain this inflation and to address inflationary pressures. The next. Uh, and this one just uh, uh, indicates what the main uh, drivers of food inflation are. Um, and uh, if you look uh, again from April to May, we can see that um, what is actually driving the, the food inflation from 10.1 to 10.2 is actually uh, vegetables. Uh, Non-vegetables have actually been declining. I think we have a chart that is coming up that will show you the developments in, non, uh, in prices of non-vegetables. Uh, but here you can see between uh, April and May, you have an increase in the, in the contribution of, uh, of vegetables from 1.4 to 1.9, uh, whereas the contribution for non-vegetables actually declines from 8.7 to 8.4. So this is our main drivers of uh, food um, inflation. I think uh, I don't need to go into the too much details. Let's go to the next, uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the contribution of prices. of the, We've looked at the four key uh, food items, wheat, maize, milk, and edible oils. And you can see, uh, since about uh, September of 2022, there's been a downward uh, trend in the contribution of these four items into the food, uh, food inflation. Um, and, uh, and obviously also into the overall rate of inflation. Right now, if you look at May, for example, uh, these four items uh, contribute 1.2 percentage points uh, out of the 8% um, uh, overall, overall GDP, overall uh, inflation. Um, uh, inflation. Uh, and this is uh, quite, uh, quite low compared to, uh, to the peak when of uh, September 2022, when actually uh, almost 50% of uh, overall inflation was coming from wheat, maize, uh, milk, and edible oils. Um, so this is just a, a focus on uh, sugar prices because sugar prices have uh, shown uh, a trend uh, of being uh, very high. And you can see that the 12 month um, uh, inflation for, for sugar is actually about 50%. Uh, that's very high. And just sugar itself is contributing to uh, the overall inflation uh, by 0.7 percentage points. Uh, percentage points. Now, expectations, inflationary expectations. This, we were very concerned about inflationary expectations. And the reason why we were concerned is if you compare uh, what um, the respondents uh, in this survey uh, were saying between May and June, Take, for example, uh, the, during May, the people who, the respondents who were expecting inflation to decrease in the next one month. And you can see there, the 25%, 25.5% of uh, respondents were expecting inflation to come down. In the survey for June, that 25.5% has actually declined to 11%. 0.1%. Similarly, for, uh, for those who are expect respondents expecting over the next three months inflation to decrease, uh, during May it was 43.8, and that percentage has declined all the way to 26.4. And uh, so that uh, has actually fed into um, respondents expecting higher inflation compared to, to May. For example, uh, those who expect uh, inflation to rise in the next one month has increased from 44 to 
Uh, and, and those expecting over the three months, it has increased from 42.5 to actually 54.2. So again, um, this was a major concern of ours. We want to anchor inflationary expectations. Indica indications from respondents was actually the opposite, that people were actually expecting inflation to continue to accelerate. And therefore, it was very critical that we take action to address this change in uh, inflationary expectations and, uh, and hopefully um, uh, anchor those uh, expectations so that people don't make decisions on the basis of expecting inflation to accelerate. Uh, on, the, um, on the growth uh, story, um, here you can see that um, the overall growth uh, for this year, we expect it to be around 5.5. That is the last uh, column. And uh, this is an increase from the 4.8% uh, uh, that was recorded last year. And the main story here is that we expect uh, a recovery in agriculture. Uh, it contracted last year by 1.6. Uh, this year we expect um, an expansion in agriculture. I think the rains have been quite, uh, quite robust so far. And so therefore we expect, uh, we expect agriculture to recover. We also expect uh, services to remain robust at 6% uh, compared to 7% last year. And so generally we are quite um, uh, bullish and uh, positive on the growth uh, prospects for this coming year. And I think that, that optimism is borne out by the composite index of economic uh, activity. We, uh, we do have uh, that index, you can see, for the first quarter of 2023, uh, first quarter shows uh, a growth of 5.1. I think that is consistent with what we expect, uh, the 5.5% the growth that we expect for the whole year. Now, um, again, uh, just coming back to the agricultural re recovery, these are just examples of what we, uh, what we expect and what has actually happened through May. Uh, under horticultural exports, um, you can uh, look at the, um, the performance, the volumes uh, through May, and you can see that the blue line compared to the, uh, to the purple uh, line is above and therefore uh, so far, the volumes uh, and growth of uh, horticulture compared to last year is much higher this year. Uh, similar story for, uh, for milk. Um, I think uh, initially this year, the first two months, it was very difficult. It was hot and was very dry. So, uh, so milk production had, had, um, had gone uh, down. But you can see now since uh, March, there's a huge actually recovery and uh, there's a big upswing in milk production. This is a table just summarizes uh, what we expect uh, on, um, on food, food crops. We expect maize to increase quite significantly uh, compared to the contraction that was there in 2022. We also expect wheat uh, beans to also increase, Irish potatoes, basically most items to increase. The only one that we, uh, there may be an issue with is rice, which uh, we see a reduction in, um, in production of rice. Uh, on the manufacturing sector, again, this is just an issue. Um, if you go back to the to the table on growth, uh, you see that manufacturing, um, yeah, this one. You can see that manufacturing in 2022 growth was 2.7. We are expecting an acceleration in growth uh, to 3.5. And uh, the charts, go back to the charts, is just an indication um, or proxy for higher manufacturing activity. And you can see that total power consumption in the first uh, five months, which is represented by the purple line, is well above the, the, the blue line. And uh, similarly for the, the trend of large power uh, consumers, uh, the same uh, pattern uh, is there, that um, uh, consumption in 2023 
is above, uh, in fact, it is above all uh, other uh, years, 2022 and 2021. On private sector uh, credits, um, I think since, since March, you can see, we've had uh, credit to the private sector from the banking system, has recovered quite, uh, quite nicely from the past uh, several years. I know we are only showing from 2019, but I think if you go back even up to 2016, you will see, you see that uh, growth uh, to the private sector was very muted, uh, may have been maybe around 4%. But uh, since March of 2022, we have seen uh, the credit to the private sector has picked up. And now, uh, and since that time, uh, you can see that uh, it has been in double digit um, territory. And for the two months, April and May, recorded uh, quite a significant increase of 13.2%. Uh, uh, so these are just uh, uh, specific examples of credit to uh, some of the key sectors of the economy. I uh, can see manufacturing uh, the last two months for April and May is quite robust. Uh, it's 21.7 and 19.3. Uh, similarly, trade, and actually if you just go back to manufacturing, you can see that since January there's been an upward trend in credit to, uh, uh, from the banking system to the manufacturing sector. Same thing with trade, again an upward trend up to 15.4%. Transport communication is also quite robust. And uh, consumer durables continues to be double digit, but uh, I think uh, with maybe inflation um, uh, last year, there may have been uh, kind of a, a slowdown in consumer, in consumer durables. Um, next. So this is the overall balance of payments. Uh, it's obviously, you can't, you can't uh, see uh, this, it's difficult to see. But essentially, maybe just to uh, summarize on the, on, the, on the balance of payments, we, uh, we do expect uh, the current account um, deficit to narrow from 5.1% to 4.8% uh, this year. Uh, we also do expect uh, some sig significant inflows, um, both from the IMF uh, and also from, from other, from other de development uh, partners. And overall, we expect an overall balance of payments surplus of uh, almost $200 million. Uh, and that is actually compared to uh, a deficit last year of uh, more than $2 billion. Uh, so this is a chart, uh, again, showing um, exports uh, and uh, up to it shows up to the year up to May, and uh, from May of 2022 to May of 2023, I believe the growth rate is uh, five is 5.5 percent. Uh, Again, just representing, just showing that uh, export performance will be uh, will be positive. That's up to May, of course. Uh, we still have to make uh, projections up to the end of uh, up to the end of December, but so far so good. On, uh, on imports, I believe. Okay, so, okay, this, uh, this sorry, you, you can pass it. This is just the 12 month cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, exports. This is also the 12 month uh, cumulative uh, imports in terms, of, uh, in terms of dollars, just giving you different uh, categories of imports, oil, chemicals, manufacturing machinery and, um, and, uh, and others. Next slide. Our travel receipts, uh, here you can see uh, a significant recovery in, uh, in travel receipts over the, the first five months. Um, and indeed, if you look at the purple line of 2023, or the purple columns, you can see all of them uh, from January, February, March, April, and May. They are all significantly higher than uh, during the previous, uh, previous years. On uh, transport uh, receipts, uh, here, uh, 
they are still they are still robust, but uh, not as um, not as uh, high as in the previous in the previous year. Again, here is the diaspora remittances. These have been a very steady source of foreign exchange, and you can see every year there's been a, a significant um, upward upward uh, trend. Uh, for 2022, 2023, uh, there's a bit of a flattening out. And um, as I indicated earlier, most of, uh, about 57% of uh, remittances come from the United States. And as we saw in the, in the earlier table where the growth of the uh, US economy is actually slowing down from two, I think it was from two point, uh, 2.1 to 1 1.6. Um, so this could be, uh, this could, uh, that slowdown of the U.S. economy may uh, be part of the story explaining why there's a flattening of the diaspora remittances. Having said that, um, uh, obviously, in terms of Kenyan shillings, uh, there will still be a significant increase given that the exchange rate has moved uh, this year compared to, um, to last year. Okay, this is the current account. We already discussed the current account, but the important is to see uh, is just the trend in the current account. Um, uh, I think for quite a number of years, it's been roughly 5% five, five to 5.5%, five, uh, maybe from 2018. And uh, it has now come down to 4.8% through May of this year. And uh, our projections indicate that by the end of uh, this year, by, <clears throat> by December, that the current account uh, will be 4.8% compared to the 5.1% uh, that uh, was realized in 2022. Uh, so this is the CBK's usable foreign exchange. Uh, uh, the current level as of uh, June is uh, 7 billion, seven, almost 7.4 uh, billion, billion, and that's equivalent to 4.07 months of import cover. It's consistent with our statutory requirement, and um, it's, it's fairly uh, robust uh, in terms of, trying, uh, in terms of uh, being a, a, a buffer against um, uh, external shocks. Uh, so this is a, on the fiscal side. Um, this is just to show the domestic uh, debt performance. You can see that um, we were able to uh, to provide to mobilize resources of up to 436 uh, billion uh, compared to a target of 475 billion meaning that we achieve the 92% um, uh, target. Most of that borrowing is in uh, T-bills. The, the share now of T-bills in, um, in, in, total, in total lending is about 87%, and only 13% is in uh, T-bills. And also the average time to maturity for, the, for those treasury bonds is roughly uh, about uh, nine, uh, nine years. On fiscal performance, uh, this is a fiscal consolidation uh, plan. You can see from 2020 to 2021, when the uh, overall fiscal deficit was 8.2, uh, it has been declining every year. This year, um, that ends uh, this month, uh, the deficit is estimated to be 5.8%. Uh, this includes the, uh, the, the second supplementary budget and the, the budget that has been approved by uh, Parliament and the accompanying um, fiscal uh, finance uh, act will result in a further narrowing of the fiscal deficit to 4.4% of GDP. And over the medium term, we expect the deficit to narrow further to 3.6%. And all this uh, will be with the idea of reducing 
the overall uh, debt to GDP towards a sustainable level. And as you know, the parliament has now uh, agreed to having a debt anchor of 55% of net present value of debt to GDP. And this profile of fiscal consolidation and reducing the fiscal deficit should move us towards that level of uh, debt to GDP. Um, that's the fiscal framework. Uh, the numbers are not very clear. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but essentially it's the same story as, uh, as we, just looked, uh, we just looked at. With the deficit this year uh, being 5.8%, uh, followed by the um, further consolidation to 4.4% uh, uh, next year and over the medium term to reduce it to 3.6 percent. So I think that's it and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Governor. That was Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, who's also the Chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee, Dr. Kamau Thuge. Uh, and as is customary, we'll take your questions. There's quite a number of questions coming in. The reminder is to please send your questions through Slido. That's www.slido.com. The meeting is hashtag MPC0623. Uh, and like we said, uh, we are keeping the questions on the Monetary Policy Committee decision as well as uh, sort of adjacent questions on the economy. So I'll begin with the first ones. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Jimmy Mbogo from KTN is asking, what informed the decision to hike the CBR at a time when LPLs, that is uh, non-performing uh, loans, are rising? And what incentive will banks have to lend to the real economy? Kefa Moirore from the Business Daily, uh, the surprise rate hike comes barely a month after the MPC met and held rates in May. Does this suggest that the MPC had not tightened policy enough previously? Charles Moniki from the Business Daily, uh, what is your outlook on inflation considering that the VAT change on fuel and possible food price jump on the end uh, of the, back, of the Black, Black Sea Grain Initiative next month? Uh, David Hubling for the last one in this batch. David Hubling from Bloomberg, by how many basis points do you see the new 16% VAT on petroleum products boosting the inflation rates? How are you prepared to fight second round effects? So we'll take those questions for now and we'll take the further ones as they come. Okay, let me, let me start with um, the CAFA um, um question, which was the surprise rate hike comes barely a month after the MPC met and held rates in May. Does this suggest that the MPC had not uh, tightened uh, policy enough previously. I think as I, as I explained, um, the information that the Monetary Policy Committee had when they made that decision to um, retain the rate at 9.5 was that it looked like inflation was actually coming down. It had come down from 9.2 to 7.9%. Uh, and, uh, and even non-food, uh, non-fuel uh, had also declined. The internal uh, projections were, in fact, that uh, inflation would, uh, the near-term inflation would uh, continue to, uh, to decline. And therefore, at that point when they made that decision, uh, it was not that they had not tightened enough, but given the information that they had, uh, perhaps uh, it made sense not to uh, further tighten monetary policy, given that uh, rates were coming down and that it was expected to, um, for further, for further uh, deceleration. Uh, of course, as I have explained, uh, we, since that time, uh, new information has uh, become available, and indeed, uh, inflationary pressures have been rising. Uh, inflationary expectations have increased, and therefore, we found it a very necessary to uh, relook at the situation uh, using the new uh, new data and new information, and that is what uh, informed the monetary policy uh, committee decision to.
to uh, hike um, the CBR by 100 basis uh, points. Um, so uh, to uh, answer uh, Mr. Jimmy Bogo's uh, question, um, indeed uh, NPLs have uh, been rising. Uh, they are now at 14.9%. Uh, percent. Um, now, uh, it's important to note part of the reason for why the NPLs have been increasing. They are broadly, I would, I would say broadly, they're into, into two areas. Uh, one is a business uh, environment, um, uh, and the other is the fact that um, the government, uh, the national government as well as county governments have not uh, been paying some of their suppliers. Now, um, the National Treasury has just uh, gotten a lot of resources in, in the last, uh, I would say, one month. They've gotten resources from the World Bank. The World Bank dispersed uh, the one billion uh, dollars from the development policy operation. Of course, they've also mobilized uh, domestic resources through the infrastructure bond. And so we expect that the National Treasury will actually now spend uh, and, um, and also um, uh, uh, transfer the resources that are required to the county, to the county governments. And with both county governments and the national uh, government uh, paying, we would expect that uh, the level of non-performing loans will decline. Uh, in terms of the business environment, as I've said, I think the economy is looking, uh, is looking up. The, the expenditure measures and the plans that have been um, budgeted for, uh, and, and just basically in terms of the, the focus on growing the economy and the focus on the value chains in the budget, we expect that that will uh, uh, basically incentivize um, investors and result in more ec uh, economic growth. As I said, uh, we expect real GDP growth to accelerate from 4.8% uh, last year to above 5%. And I think with that improved um, business climate, we would then expect also uh, that to have a positive impact on the uh, NPLs uh, going forward. And there's a question by Charles Moniki, uh, the what is your outlook on inflation, considering the VAT uh, changes on fuel and the uh, possible food uh, price jump upon the end of the uh, Baxi Grain Initiative uh, next month. <clears throat> um, we have looked at all these uh, factors in terms of uh, where we ex expect inflation to be. And uh, we, we do think, uh, for example, on the issue of the VAT, um, uh, obviously there are also offsetting factors, as you are aware, um, that uh, the, the import declaration uh, fee has, has been reduced from 3.5 to 2.5. And uh, similarly, the Royal Development Levy has also been reduced from, um, I believe it's to 2% uh, to 1.5. So these will mitigate any impact uh, that they are, may arise from the VAT on, on fuel. But we do, uh, we do expect um, some, some, uh, some increase in, um, in July. Uh, but uh, overall, given the actions that we are now taking, we actually do expect that uh, by August, uh, uh, earliest and latest by September, we expect the overall rate of inflation to come uh, to below the upper range of 7.5 and to be within, firmly uh, within the um, the, the, our target, target uh, range of uh, between 2.5 and 7.5. Uh, from Bloomberg, uh, the question is by how many basis points do you see the uh, new 16% VAT on petroleum products boosting the inflation rate? And um, how are we prepared to fight uh, second round effects? 
I think, uh, uh, David, the, uh, the fighting of the second round effects is precisely what we are trying to do with the increasing of the CBR from uh, 9.5 to 10.5. As I uh, emphasized even in my presentation, uh, we, we are very concerned about the trend in the non-food, uh, non-fuel uh, inflation. Uh, for some time, uh, it has been below uh, 3%. It is now uh, above 4%. And uh, that increase also reflects the second round effects from the fuel and, uh, and, and food prices. And indeed, uh, again, um, we want, we want to be able to bring down a non-food, non-fuel to below uh, 3% because we believe that uh, the over, uh, an overall inflation of around 5% is consistent with uh, non-food, non-fuel uh, inflation of uh, below 3%. I think those are the... Thank you, Governor. Uh, the second batch of questions will begin with Raman Yang from... CGT in Africa. Uh, Rama asks, is the Central Bank of Kenya shepherding talks with banks on a domestic bond swap deal as part of efforts to reduce the finance ministry's debt service costs? Gerald Gekara from Uzalendo News, the new government to government deal for fuel importers. When do you expect to see the effects of that deal to our dollar reserves? Uh, coming back to Rama Nyang of CGT in Africa, uh, Rama is saying that two key markets, which is Egypt and Pakistan, are having significant dollar issues. How is that affecting dollar inflow? And is there a significant dollar receivables position built up? So let me start with the, the first one. The CBK shepherding talks <clears throat> with banks on a domestic uh, bond swap deal as part of efforts to reduce the finance ministry's debt service uh, costs. Uh, no, we're not. We are not uh, sharpening any, any of those uh, talks. Um, I do believe that um, the, the fiscal framework of the National Treasury has incorporated all these uh, the debt service uh, payments, including uh, the impact of, uh, of a higher uh, exchange rate. And, uh, and uh, as I just indicated earlier, the um, they have um, a trend, uh, they, or they have a plan to reduce the overall uh, fiscal deficit and to achieve a sustainable debt position and fiscal position over the medium term. On the issue of uh, the new government-to-government uh, -government deal for fuel importers, when do we uh, expect to see the effects of that deal to our dollar uh, reserves? I think um, this, uh, the, the government to government or the G2G uh, deal on uh, fuel importers has obviously helped in terms of reducing pressures on the exchange rate. Uh, the total amount of um, dollars, uh, the least demand uh, in dollars that has re been removed from the market is about $500 million per month. Um, and obviously, this has helped uh, to reduce the gap between the demand and supply of dollars. Uh, otherwise, we may have had an even um, a deeper depreciation of the of the exchange rate. Um, and maybe I take the issue on the issue of uh, the impact on our dollar reserves together with um, this other question by Rama Nyang. Uh, on uh, Egypt and Pakistan and, and uh, having significant dollar issues and how is that affecting dollar inflows. As I, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, I'd rather look at this from a broader perspective because ultimately uh, what uh, determines the inflow of dollars into the economy is the balance of payments. And um, as I did indicate, uh, we expect exports to grow quite uh, robustly. Um, I already said that uh, through May we had uh, growth of uh, exports by 5.5%. We have robust uh, uh, remittances, uh, uh, inflows, uh, the services, uh, tourism is doing quite, uh, quite well. 
And, uh, and indeed, uh, we are getting disbursements from our development partners. And all this, as I said earlier, uh, will result in an overall balance of payment surplus of about $200 uh, million. And that's compared to, a, to um, a deficit or an outflow of dollars last year of uh, or just slightly over $2 billion. Um, that's it. So we will take uh, another two batches of questions. I'll begin with uh, a question from David Herbling again from Bloomberg News. Uh, when do you see Kenya offering a dollar-denominated bond locally and what size are you looking at? Justin Mwangi from SBG Securities is asking, was the rate hike partially meant to support the shilling as well? Uh, Rama Nyang from CGTN, African economies accounted for 12% of Kenya's imports and 42% of exports in the first quarter of 2023. Can the Afrexin Bank PAPS system meaningfully cut Kenya's dollar demand? Uh, finally, for these ones, uh, Stella Swake from Standard Investment Bank, Two questions. Uh, what, how does CBK plan to support private sector credit growth amid jumbo rate hikes and high government securities yields, which continue to crowd out the sector? Uh, and she continues to ask, should we expect more rate hikes? Let me start with um, the first question by David uh, Hobling uh, on whether Kenya will be offering a dollar-denominated uh, bond locally. Um, I, I, this is one of the issues I had, um, I had discussed during my vetting. And, but it was uh, more part in terms of this is one of the areas that we would like to explore. Uh, we will do it with the uh, with, uh, National uh, Treasury to see whether it, um, um, it, uh, it, it's doable, whether it, uh, it works. Um, but the whole idea really was uh, to be able to um, to mop up some of the uh, um, maybe excess um, dollars that may be there. Uh, also encourage maybe Kenyan diaspora to be able to come and invest in those in, in those bonds, and that would increase the supply of foreign exchange, uh, which obviously would come to the. To the national uh, to the national treasury first, and then obviously then uh, it will go to the, the the national treasury would switch or would swap shillings uh, uh, for and give uh, the central bank dollars and and uh, retain the shillings for their own um, for their own expenditure. So it's a um, discussion that uh, we uh, will have with the national treasury. And to see whether um, it's, um, it can be done, or, um, it can be done. There's a question from uh, Justin Mwangi: Was the rate hike partially meant to support the shilling as well? Um, I would say that uh, it, it will help support the shilling. Um, although our main focus uh, really was to try to uh, address these inflationary expectations I've been mentioning, which have uh, increased quite significantly between April and May. Uh, however, by, um, uh, by, the, by the very fact that uh, the CBR uh, rate is, uh, is higher, we would expect uh, maybe even uh, to attract uh, um, foreign exchange to come into Kenya, and that could uh, help support the, the Kenyan uh, shilling. On the, um, on the issue of the, the Afri-Exim Bank, and, uh, and whether that would immediately cut um, uh, Kenya's dollar demand, <coughs> Um, we are very. Uh, we are in the midst of um, uh, discussions with Afri Axim uh, on how uh, we can join the this Pan African payments and uh, settlement uh, system. Uh, of course, as you know, we do have our own East African payments and uh, settlement system, uh, and uh, but uh, definitely. Uh, the pubs would uh, reduce the demand uh, for dollars, uh, and so we are looking very much forward to that um, to that discussion and how we move forward uh, towards the pubs 
in light of the um, of uh, uh, moving also to, uh, towards the African continental um, free trade uh, area. Um, there's a question here by Stella. Uh, whether whether the uh, borrowing by the government uh, will continue to crowd out the private sector, uh, and should we expect uh, more rate hikes? I um, I think, uh, Stella, you if you look at the fiscal fiscal framework, especially for twenty three twenty four, and perhaps we'll have another. Um, discussion on this uh, because I believe that the the estimated or the projected um, borrowing by government for the next financial year will be significantly less than than this year and sig and significantly less than was indicated in the um, in the budget policy statement. And because it's so much uh, lower, I do expect that um, as the government reduces its borrowing requirements, um, that, that um, the banks will turn to lending to the private sector. So I am not so much concerned uh, uh, now about whether the government will crowd out the private sector given the, the proposed reduction in the fiscal deficit from 5.8 to 4.4% and over the medium term to 3.6. In fact, I think that uh, fis fiscal consolidation plan will actually be crowding in uh, rather than crowding out the private sector. The last batch of questions, we'll begin with Duncan Mireri from Reuters. Uh, he is asking the governor to comment on the disparity between the policy rate and the yield curve uh, where government of Kenya debt auctions are recording yields of more than 14 percent. Julian Zamboko from NTV Kenya uh, asks how the numbers looking from an output gap standpoint and how do you see this defining the MPC's conduct in the near term. Eric Mokaya from Wango Capital what impact do you expect on the economy and on inflation from the Finance Act 2023? And finally, Aristarikas Kuria from Neofin Entrepreneur. Per your parliament's uh, vetting closing remark, first, when do you expect to have uh, the microfinance bill passed? And two, your views on the MFB sector for transformation and transition. Maybe I can start with the uh, Buona Kuria. Um, the, this microfinance bill we, we submitted to Parliament um, actually last year was submitted by by the by Treasury last year. Um, it had been approved by Cabinet, uh, but Parliament has not um, uh, moved on it. So, so uh, indeed, uh, I did mention it during my vetting, and uh, we will as uh, CBK be following up with the chairman of the finance committee to see how we can expedite the, uh, this, uh, this particular bill because we, we, we obviously see the microfinance uh, as, as, a key, as a key sector for uh, financial deepening and for financial inclusion uh, as well. Um, On the issue of the, the um, inflation um, arising from the Finance Act, I think I already uh, addressed uh, that. They, they, are, they are mitigating factors, um, but uh, essentially the, we have looked at all the impact arising from the Finance uh, Bill, uh, Finance Act, um, now that it's an act. and. Um, so the actions that we have taken to raise the CBR rate is actually to address any potential impact uh, those measures might have on, uh, on inflation. Uh, Mr. Julian uh, Amboko um, uh, talks about how the numbers looking from an output gap standpoint, st standpoint and how do you uh, see this defining the MPC's conduct in the near term. Indeed, we have looked at um, the, 
the output uh, gap um, and uh, we are almost I think right now we are almost um, at the at the same at the same level as um, as the uh, as the long term uh, growth of the economy, so the out output gap is not uh, that uh, very much different. Uh, in 2020, uh, obviously there was a big gap because of the, um, the COVID COVID-19 um, domestic um, uh, production and real GDP growth actually was negative. And therefore, it was well uh, below the trend, uh, the long-term uh, long growth. So going forward, we, uh, we believe that um, the real GDP growth is uh, moving towards the long-term uh, long trend. And therefore, there's a convergence uh, in the two. And uh, we really don't see the output uh, gap being a determinant on um, on whether we are going to raise uh, interest rates or not, or in the sense where the uh, the uh, real GDP growth uh, maybe exceed the long-term growth and therefore exert uh, inflationary pressures on the economy, we do see them right now uh, going uh, in pace, uh, the two of them, uh, without um, uh, too much aggregate demand uh, being over the um, the long-term growth of the of the economy. Um, there was a question about the uh, disparity of the of the policy rate and the and the yield curve, uh, where GOK debt uh, actions are uh, recording yields of more than uh, fourteen percent. Again, as I as I just indicated, I think um, the yields uh, will will slow down. I think uh, as we go into the next financial year uh, with. Uh, um, enhanced uh, revenue collection uh, with actually a, a cut in expenditures in terms of uh, GDP and in terms of uh, reducing the government borrowing uh, from the domestic uh, economy, uh, we expect yields actually to stabilize and perhaps even uh, come down during the course of the year and then we can see some kind of a convergence between the policy rate and the um, and the yields on the on the government debt. Thank you, and that brings us uh, neatly to the end of this post MPC press conference. Uh, just to remind you, this presser is after the MPC met yesterday, uh, made a decision, and uh, all those can be found uh, on our website. This is a press release uh, after the MPC and lots of the documents that are related, including uh, some of the publications. And this uh, slide presentation will be made available to you uh, through the usual channels, that is our website, uh, and through other channels that you are uh, welcome to. As we said at the beginning, we shall be having a press conference uh, with the governor and the deputy governor uh, within the next couple of weeks. So uh, please be on the lookout for that, uh, members of the media. Uh, and the MPC, as the governor indicated, We'll be meeting again uh, in July uh, in the usual cycle. And so we shall see you at either one of those two press conferences. But for now, we'd like to thank you and do have yourselves a good afternoon.